I titled the sermon, I am resolved no longer to linger. I'm not dwelling on the song that we sing, though we're going to sing that at the end. I'm not dwelling on that song. But I think as you as we go through the sermon and at the end, you'll see why it's a perfect fitting song and a title for the sermon. It's that time of year again. People who make resolutions do them now for one reason or another. 41% of North Americans make New Year's resolutions. 17% frequently make New Year's resolutions. And that leaves 42% who don't make any New Year's resolutions. Only 9% feel like they accomplished a goal, while less than 8% actually accomplish their resolution. Over the years I've shared all the different kinds of resolutions are losing weight, quitting smoking, spending more time with family, getting out of debt, all of these, and it comes up every year. Now those who don't make resolutions look at things like the 8% or less than 8% and they say, what's the point? You're just setting yourself up for failure. And so why do the 41% make New Year's resolutions? Well, I believe that the intention is a good one. I believe that most people are thinking about new things with the new year. They're thinking about a fresh start. They're thinking about maybe improving on some things they did last year. And we look forward to new things. We look forward to better things. And so the resolutions are a help to get us along that track. The trouble is, unless you actually are willing to change yourself, nothing in the next year is going to really change. And it doesn't matter what resolution whoops, that you make. It doesn't matter. If you don't change, nothing's going to really change. And the same can be said about your spiritual life. It's good to make resolutions, it's good to set goals, but unless you're willing to change spiritually, unless you're willing to grow, it's not going to help to set a resolution. Over my Christian life, I've heard so many resolutions from people who wanted to begin the new year with high hopes of becoming more spiritual. And, and just like the, the worldly resolutions, you get into the new year and you get going and your life doesn't really seem to change. I mean, you're back at the same job, you're assembling with the same people at church, you're associating with the same people, you're, you're doing the same things you did just before the new year happened, and, and you kind of get into a rut, and the resolution just kind of drifts on to, into no man's land and is gone. And I'll put myself in that category, I've done it time and time again, and all of us have, if we want to be honest with ourselves. And I believe our intentions are good. No one plans to fail. No one plans to not be a success. They plan to win and to be a success. But human nature is always involved in it. And our spiritual resolutions, to achieve them, we have to do the same thing as to achieve the worldly ones. We have to be willing to change. And if we don't change, I can give you a guarantee. Your spiritual life won't change because you have to be willing to change. So this morning, I want to share some things that Paul talks about in the book of Ephesians in chapter 5 and around verse 15 and on, onward. I believe that Paul gives us some things there that would be really good for us to maybe look at as for resolutions in the new year. The first thing he says in verse 15 is, Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish but understand what the will of the Lord is. I looked up careful because sometimes I like to have my main points all start with the same letter. It's a thing I do, call it OCD, whatever you want to call it. 
But thrifty is a synonym. It is. It means the same or similar thing as careful. So because my other words started with T, I'm going to go with thrifty. The first thing Paul encourages us to do here is to be thrifty in our walk with the Lord. That is our life that we are living. He says, be wise. Well, why would he say be wise instead of foolish? Well, in the previous verses, he talks about us walking as children of light, bearing fruit that the children of light are supposed to bear versus the unfruitfulness of living in darkness, living in the world, which leads to death. And what he's talking about is the choices you and I make, the decisions that we decide, the moves we make, the things we say, the things we do. All of those things need to be done with a thrifty, with thrifty consideration. Why are we doing them? What is the point of doing it? What is the point of saying something? Why am I saying that? He wants us to be very purposeful in our walk. Consider each step that we take. Consider each thing that we say. Is it godly focused? Will it glorify God? Or is it just of my desire and of this world? Because we have a life that we need to be thrifty about living for Christ Jesus. In Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 4, Paul talks about there and he says that our hearts need to be set on things above where Christ is seated. And he tells us also that our minds need to be focused on things above, not on the earthly things. And that's what Paul's trying to get across here. He says, be thrifty in how you walk. And be thrifty um, by making the best use of your time because the days are evil. If you think back, there was a soap opera. It blew my mind when I actually looked this up. But there was a soap opera that was titled As the World Turns. And it started in 1956. And it ended in 2010. It ran for 54 years. The title of that should have really been As the World Spins because the world is spinning and it's spinning out of control. The further that we get away from our Creator, the harder it spins. And if you look around you, you, it doesn't take much to see that the days are evil. Read the news, read your web page, uh, listen to the radio or the TV. Evil abounds everywhere. The, the atrocities that people are doing is just evil. But the world doesn't want to call it that anymore. They just, these people are troubled. They're, they're sick, they're this and they're this, and they make all these excuses. No, it's evil. That's what God said it is. Plain and simple, it's evil. And Paul says the days are evil. And because of that, he says, you need to use your time wisely. You see, your time that you have is not really yours. It's Jesus' time. And if you think about it, he's given you that time. When he says it's enough, that time's no more for you. And so you're using Jesus' time. You're using God's time. It's not yours to use as you see fit, it's for you to use to the glory and honor of the Father in heaven. And people look at it and say, oh, I got all this time. You know, as I get older, I realize we don't have all this time. All this time is going really by really fast. I mean, it's just going. And so we have the time that God's given us. Jesus took his time on earth to die on the cross so that you and I can have eternal life with him. So my suggestion is that Paul's saying is, be wise now you use your time, be thrifty, because you don't want to be wasting God's time. That is a dangerous thing to do. And the way you accomplish that is by not being foolish, by understanding what is the will of the Lord. Too many people today claim to be Christians, 
But they're really saying they're Christians in the sense that they're not Buddhist or Muslim or Hindu or something else. That's all they're saying. And so it is a title that the world accepts as one of the many religions. And so they are Christian in name only, but definitely not in practice. Because if they were biblical Christians, they would be practicing the will of the Lord. But most people are ignorant when it comes to the will of the Lord. The reason is because they don't look in here for the will of the Lord. They look for what sounds good to them or what some friend told them or what some minister that they hold in high regard told them or this or that or whatever excuse they have. But they don't study the written will of God. And so they don't know what the will of God is. They're ignorant. And they form all kinds of opinions about what the Lord's will is. And some will even go to practice that and try to bind that on people as the will of the Lord. But when push comes to shove, their instincts take over. And instead of acting on the Lord's will, they act on their instincts. Have you ever seen somebody who said they're a Christian and in a moment's notice something goes wrong and poof and you go, whoa, wait. That's not how Jesus would act. That's what I'm talking about. There's a man who entered an alleyway, and as he drove in, there was a sign warning him that the alley was blocked. Do, do not pass. And he thought, huh, really? And he drove down the alleyway, and sure enough, he got down about halfway, and there's a big old tree laying across the alley and he can't get past it. So he maneuvered and maneuvered and maneuvered, finally got his vehicle turned around, and as he's leaving the alley, there's another sign, and it says, told you so. And that's often what we do as Christians. We go the way we want to do it, and then if it's miserable and it fails, then we go, oh, Maybe I should check with God to see what he wants me to do. That's the wrong way to do it. We have to know what the will of the Lord is and live that will. And so Paul says, be thrifty in how you walk, how you use your time, and knowing the Lord's will. And then he says in verse uh, 18, it says, And do not get drunk with wine, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Paul here is talking about being thoughtful, thinking, thinking about what you're doing. You see, the world that you and I know is very self-centered, at least the one I know, is very self-centered. And when you're looking at yourself, it is very hard to consider anyone else. Because you're focused on yourself and you can't see anyone else. Someone once wrote how a person becomes miserable. And you might relate to this, I'm not sure. They said, think about yourself, talk about yourself, use I as often as possible, mirror yourself continually in the opinion of others, listen greedily to what people say about you, expect to be appreciated always, be suspicious of everyone, be jealous and envious, be sensitive to slights, never forgive a criticism, trust nobody but yourself, insist on consideration and respect, demand agreement with your own views on everything, sulk if people are not grateful to you for favors done, never forget a service you rendered, never remember a service shown to you, shirk your duties if at all possible, and do as little as possible for others. That is a recipe for misery. Debauchery here is talking about excess indulgence in sensual pleasures for self-satisfaction. He says, when you're drinking, that's what you're thinking. He said, but that's not what you should be doing. Because... 
Anybody in here that has ever tried the stuff knows that when you're drunk, you don't think clearly. You don't think right. You don't think of anything but yourself for the, for the most part. And he says, so don't do that. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. The answer to being jolly and boisterous and exuberant about life is not to drink alcohol. It is to be filled with the indwelling of God's Spirit. And then literally, you can be high on life. Because you know what life is all about. It isn't showing in a euphoria of drunkenness, but it stands out different to the world because it is the Spirit of God that gives us that happiness and that confidence. Literally, Paul is saying that the outside influence in our life should not be drinking, which changes our demeanor and influences our lives and our character, but it should be the Spirit influencing us and changing our demeanor and our character and how we act and what we do. The Spirit of God has a distinctive influence on people, just like drinking does. When you live by the Spirit, I'm not talking about you going around doing all kinds of weird things and flipping around. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the way you live your life. It influences you and you're calm in situations where others can't be calm and you're upright in situations that others aren't upright and you are influencing people for good when people are trying to influence people for bad and and all of those things. I mean, you stand out like a sore thumb. And that's why Paul said to the Galatians in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 13, He says, you have been called to be free not to indulge in the sinful nature, but rather to fulfill the law of Christ. See, Christ freed us from our sin, not so that we could do whatever we want to do, but that we could glorify him in living a life the way it's supposed to be lived, the way God designed it to be lived. And then in chapter, in verse 22 of that same chapter 5 of Galatians, he goes on to say what the fruit of the Spirit is. The things that the Spirit influences us with in our lives. And when we are influenced by the Spirit, when we are full of the Spirit, we bear those fruits in our life. The contrast that Paul gives us here is between living in debauchery for the world, the excess indulgence of every kind of pleasure and chasing after all the things that the world has to offer, or and bearing the fruit of the Spirit in our lives that Christ wants us to bear. That's the contrast. And he said, don't do the one, do the other. Do the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Don't be filled with all that other garbage. And so... He's saying, when we walk our life, be thoughtful. Be thoughtful about these things. So be thrifty in your living your life. Be thoughtful of God and others in your life. But perhaps most importantly and most significant of all is the last point that Paul gives us. And it is a resolution to a better spiritual life. I think it is the catalyst to living a thrifty and thoughtful life. He says, starting in verse 19, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God, the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now there's a mouthful. I don't know if you've considered these passages before, But have you lived 2017 in gratefulness to God? I mean, did you live every day being grateful to God? Are you grateful for the church? 
And I don't mean the building, I mean the people. Are you grateful for the people? Are you grateful for Jesus? Are you grateful for God, your caregiver and your provider? You see, we show that, Paul says, in how, first of all, how we address one another. Do you realize that all of us are in exactly the same boat? You say, no, I'm not. I'm not like so-and-so, and I'm not like so-and-so. Yes, you are. You're a sinner. And you've been redeemed by the blood of Christ. And now you can call yourself a Christian. And yes, we're all at different stages in where we are at in getting rid of our bad life and putting in the new. We're all at different stages, but we're all in the same boat. Does it make sense to fight? Or does it make sense to encourage? What he's saying is, we need to encourage one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. We got to, in, with, with praises, but those praises belong to God. You know, um, I don't know, when we get together, am I praising myself or am I praising God? What am I doing? Am I praising God that you're my brother and sister in Christ? Or am I thinking, man, I don't want nothing to do with you. I want to get some, find someone better. What am I thinking? We have to consider these things. Paul says, man, as brothers and sisters in Christ, we should be praising one another, praising God for one another. And we need to be doing it in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And we do that. But not just Sunday morning when, when Brock gets up here and leads a song. Even if I'm off key and Diane tells me I shouldn't be singing in the car or whatever, I'm still singing because that's what we should be doing. And I, yeah, I get it. I don't, want to, I don't always want to hear myself singing either, but I want to sing. I feel like singing. But when we get together, we ought to be doing that. And so Paul says, do that, but in the mindset of giving thanks always for everything to God in the name of Jesus Christ. Sometimes I get asked why I pray in Jesus' name. That's why I pray in Jesus' name. Because we're told more times than one in Scripture that we are supposed to be doing something for God through Christ, in Christ. And that will happen. All of those things that we talked about earlier will happen if we're thankful in everything to God in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is our all in all. I believe that we all believe that. And if he's our all in all, then he deserves all of our gratefulness, all of our thankfulness, because without him, we wouldn't have anything. It just makes sense. And the conduit through which we express such thankfulness is our Lord Jesus Christ. Dr. Dale Robbins writes, I used to think people complained because they had problems. But I've come to realize that they have problems because they complain. Isn't that true? Complaining, if you haven't noticed, doesn't change a thing. It amplifies it. It amplifies frustration, it spreads discontent and discord, it evokes an invitation for the devil to cause havoc in your life. Complaining makes misery. So when we complain, we can't be thankful. Paul says, quit complaining. Quit crying about things. Be thankful always. But Dave, you can't understand what happened to me last year. I, lost, I just about lost my shirt and I lost this. And these people left me and I was... Man, be thankful for everything. You're alive. You're living. You have the blessings of God. Be thankful for everything. It doesn't matter good or bad. And most key to all of this, I believe, we can't sing praises with each other or to each other unless we can truly submit to one another. Now, I am not talking about being everybody's doormat for abuse. That's not what I'm talking about. 
But Paul says that we ought to ad- submit to one another. Now that's a challenge, isn't it? But why should we submit to one another? He says, because that is the will of the Lord. We're supposed to submit to one another in, out of reverence for Christ. I don't have to like everything you do. I don't have to like how you smell. I don't have to like how you look. It doesn't matter. I need to submit to all of you out of reverence for our Lord and Savior. And so I do it. He didn't say it's going to be a cakewalk, it's going to be easy, it's like eating cheesecake. He didn't say that. He said, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And so we have to submit to one another. He's saying, consider one another above yourself. And if all of us did that, can you imagine the chemistry that we would have in the church? The very chemistry that Jesus designed for the church. If we are busy submitting to one another, we won't have time to complain. But we will be glorifying God. And when we submit to one another, um, that means that we are also going to reap the blessings of that benefit. You see, sometimes we're very short-sighted and we give up submitting to someone and then later regret all of the things that happened because you didn't submit to that person when if you submitted, everything would have been fine. And so we got to be careful how we do that but we need to be in submission to one another, looking out for one another, considering one another. That's what he means there. We need to always be considering each other. And he says in, in Colossians that we need to do that above ourselves. Do you think that the church could use some of these resolutions for 2018? I think they could, couldn't they? The church could use that. All of us could use that. And so I am suggesting that we do that. A man called his dad on New Year's Eve to wish him a happy New Year. He asked his dad, he said, what's your New Year's resolution, dad? He said, son, I am going to try and make your mother as happy as I can every day for the whole year. And he said, oh, that's great. That's awesome, Dad. He said, is Mom there? He said, yeah. He said, Mom, what's your New Year's resolution? And without even the slightest hesitation, she said, I'm going to make sure that your father keeps his resolution. I am sure that God would like to see us keep our resolutions when it comes to being more spiritual and being more like Christ. He knows that is the way that is blessed because he's doing the blessing. Walking with the Lord, doing his will is what he asks of us. That's what he requires of us. But we get to reap the blessings of it. He hasn't asked much of us. He's done most of it himself. He just says, be faithful to me, love me, and live my will. And that's it. He's done the rest already for you and I. This morning, I've taken an admonishment of Paul's and suggested it as as some resolutions that we all might work on this coming year. You don't have to. I'm not going to make you. No one's going to make you. But I would encourage you to because the only thing that it's going to do for you is help you in your relationship with God help you in your relationship with the church, and nothing bad and hurtful will come from it. No one will force you to keep these resolutions, but it would be a good thing for all of us to encourage each other with these resolutions. And together, we can then reap the blessings and benefits of them as long as God grants us breath of air in 2018. 
and the bonus, people all around us will see us and they will know that we have been with Jesus and that we still are with Jesus. So God's blessings to everyone here and I'm going to say God's blessings to his church around the world as we begin a new year. Let's focus on bringing him glory and honor through our thrifty and thoughtful and thankful lives that we live. If we can help you here this morning with something, we invite you to let us know what that is so we can help you while we stand and sing. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have allured my sight. I will hasten to Him, hasten so glad. sin and strife. He is the true one, he is the just one, ye have the words of life. I will hasten, hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. each day. Heed what he saith, do what he willeth, he is the living way. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Hasten glad and free, Jesus, Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to To enter the kingdom, leaving the paths of sin. Friends may oppose me, foes may beset me, still will I enter in. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Hasten 